Now, I think nothing can be more clear than that this church's terms of communions are prejudicial to and inconsistent with our attained reformation in the terms of communion required by that reforming church. And hence, she must be unsound and her terms of communion sinful. But lest any should allege that I put a false gloss upon the formula, the terms of her communion, and say, the formula does not formally renounce our covenants, etc., I shall adduce a few instances to make good the affirmative from the acts of this revolution church, explanative of the foresaid terms, that is, doctrines, tenets, and opinions, etc., renounced in the formula. Number one, I find in the fifth act of assembly, 1690, that this church accounts Mr. Shields, L., and Boyd, their appearances for the covenanted cause, prior to their closing with them, contrary to the order of this church, yea, schismatical and divisive courses. Number two, besides by divisive courses, etc., renounced in that canonical oath, that is, the formula, this church foresaid gives to understand they chiefly mean the preaching up our covenanted reformation, prosecuted, uh, prosecuting the ends of the covenant, bearing testimony against their defections and sinful compliances and unfaithfulness, together with applying of doctrines against the sins of late and present times, witness this church's persecution, prosecution, censuring, and deposing the late Mr. John Hepburn and Mr. John McMillan, and excommunicating Mr. James Gilchrist, as plainly appears from all their tyrannical acts compared with the said formula, and one another mentioned in the fifth head above. Number three. This church foresaid in the 10th Act of Assembly, 1694, did appoint, as soon as they saw in their presence, Mr. John Hepburn appear for Reformation principles, all their respective presbyteries to cause all young men, under trials for license, etc., renounce all divisive courses, etc., before they obtain an extract of their license. Furthermore, that which seems to confirm the above assertion and to render it yet more evident is that this present church ordains all presbyteries to license none to preach or to admit none into churches except such as give good evidence of their peaceable principles and good affection to this present government both in church and state. Yea, if a young man on trials of the ministry will not approve of the fifth act of, of assembly, 1720, etc., condemning the marrow, etc., he must be rejected. See the 5th and 16th Acts of Assembly, 1705, which, considering how matters in civil and ecclesiastic government are now stated and circumstantiate, how vastly distanced from, yea, opposite to the plain and fab excuse me, opposite to the plan and fabric of our renowned Reforming Church, infers a plain disowning and rejecting these excellent principles so valiantly contended for, and that both in principle and practice, especially seeing the acts foresaid must always be seconded with taking the illimited oaths to the government and subscribing that formula containing an oath of absolute subjection to the brethren, etc., as above. Number four. Albeit these oaths or formulas foresaid, the terms of, of this church's communion be thus heinous and sinful. Yet I find in the seventh act of assembly, 1725, that all members of the general assembly, whether ministers or elders, whether commissioners from presbyteries, commissioners from colleges, or commissioners from boroughs, are appointed to have it insert in their several commissions that they have subscribed their respective formulas as above, with certification, in case of failure, that their commission shall be rejected. See also Assembly 1718, Act 9, Assembly 1719, Act 6, Assembly 1722, Act 10, all to the same purpose. Number five. If it be objected that all ministers and entrance into the ministry are obliged to subscribe the confession of faith as well as the formula, I answer, as this church hath thrown the covenants and revolution principles out of doors by the revolution principles and ensnaring formulas foresaid, so it deserves consideration that in all acts of assembly, in joining ministers and elders to subscribe the said confession and formulas, there is not so much as one word appointing or enjoining any one person to subscribe even the Westminster Confession of Faith as ratified by law in the 16th Act of Parliament, 1649, which was a ratification exceeding preferable to that in the year 1690. In regard that Act 1649 not only ratifies the Confession of Faith, the Catechism's larger and lesser, but also all the acts of assembly approving both catechisms and confession of faith, and in part explaining the same. Nay, this must be shunned with all due caution, because that would have brought them under a necessity of renouncing revolution principles, to which it is evidently opposite in doctrine, worship, discipline, and government. Hence their rejecting this more excellent standard, and confining themselves to the lame one, 
so prodigiously mangled and misshapen with their own hands, too, seems convincingly to prove that this church has not only poured contempt on our attained reformation, but with their solemn oath and elite, excuse me, with their solemn oath and ordination engagements, have bound up themselves in subscribing these formulas from ever making any suitable endeavors towards retrieving this ground willfully lost. Now, from the whole, I infer that not a few subscribers of this formula are put, firstly, to condemn several things they judged lawful in their own former practice, and in the former and present practice of others, yea, and even some points of doctrine of a very tender and intrinsic nature. Secondly, put to approve the deeds and practices of others, which they are obliged to reckon sinful, yea, and to affirm somewhat as truth, which they know to be false. Thirdly, put to some, excuse me, put to come under engagements for the future, which to restrain from prosecuting duties called for, and what cannot be neglected without great sin for the time to come, whereby they are involved in the sins of what is past, and rendered accessory to the inconveniences and evils which may come in regard they are bound up with their own consent, from endeavoring the prevention thereof in the way of duty, and thereby have their consciences defiled. Instance they are receiving into the bosom of the church and holding communion with that vagrant Methodist, Whitefield, who had received orders in the Episcopal Church of England, by whom such loose and latitudinarian notions were introduced into the land. Hence, then, all ministers, etc., being bound by the terms of communion, with certification, etc., to take and subscribe such formulas which are sinful terms of communion, and in regard I know none but what are so entangled and bound up or join in close communion with such as are thus ensnared without any signification of a just and necessary testimony against this, and the above discovered abominations this church is chargeable with, and so joining with such would both involve the joiners in sin and the approbation of it in others. Proverbs 27, verse 12, and the causistical essay, page 61, says, quote, That church communion is justly hindered and the way to it obstructed by those who require sinful terms in order to the same. The rule is plain, that is, that upon no pretense, nor on the prospect of any advantage whatsoever, evil may be done, unquote. Romans 3, verse 8, Proverbs 23, verse 28, Galatians 5, 1 and 2, as well as Psalm 125, verse 5, quote, we, not, we may not buy it at the rate of acknowledging anything as truth which is not, and we are not convinced in our consciences to be so. Nor may we, for that end, recede from bearing a faithful testimony to the truths of God according to their nature and import in the ways of his appointment, which only sever the great end of his honor and the good of his people. Nor, in a word, may we go out of, the, uh, out of his way, Proverbs 10, verse 9, in the least circumstance, under the specious and painted pretenses of peace, James 3, verse 17, prudence, benefit to the church, without prevention of grievous and otherwise seemingly inevitable hurt, and other the like inconveniences which, ga which give rise and nourishment to a numerous brood of politic and urnal reasonings. Reason 15. Presbyterian dissenters dissent from this revolution church because she is obstinate in her defection and refuseth to be reclaimed. Some will be ready to say this is a very bold assertion without cause, the effect of prejudice and impudent reflection, scurrilous, malicious, and what not. If there be no ground for it, I shall willingly confess my fault and promise to do, no, to do so no more. Only let me once be heard before I be condemned, and if there be just cause for this charge, as I fear there is, then none will be offended for adducing two scriptures before I bring forth any evidences. The first is in Proverbs 27, verse 5, quote, Open rebuke is better than secret love, unquote. As well as verse 6, quote, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful, unquote. The second is in Jeremiah 7, verse 23, quote, But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people. And walk ye in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well with you, unquote. Verse 24, quote, but they hearkened not nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward and not forward." Unquote. But I return to give some proofs of the assertion, such as, number one, this church foresaid, notwithstanding of the above mentioned and other corruptions and defections whereby she is guilty of breaking down, piecemeal, that glorious work of reformation, doth to all the rest add obstinacy. 
persisting still in these sinful courses, frequently complained of and held to their eyes in print and otherwise by scripture and church acts and representations of grievances, etc., either defending every step of their defections, witness their pleading and writing in favors of the oaths of allegiance, assurance and abjuration, fasts indicted by the parliament, the association with malignants, the non-renovation of our covenants, etc., or do so extenuate and cover them that they seem to be brought under no suitable convictions of the necessity of amendment and reformation, nor see it needful to make any redress, by which obstinacy the nation's sins are kept wreathed upon it, repentance obstructed, the Lord dishonored, yea, publicly affronted, many of the godly offended, kept destitute of public and sealing ordinances, ministers and people hardened in their sin, and the glory accruing to God by a right confession, quite marred. See Revelation 3, verses 15, 16, and 17, Jeremiah 2, verses 3 and 5, Proverbs 28, verse 13. Number 2, that this church is obstinate, and will neither reform herself nor admit of reformation, appears further from this, that grievances, however weighty and significant at diverse times and by sundry hands, both at and frequently since the revolution represented under her judicatories, craving that these stumbling blocks might be removed out of the way of obtaining a full union in the Lord, could not be allowed any consideration, redress, or even so much as a hearing, particularly when, firstly, a considerable body of Presbyterian dissenters presented a paper of grievances, which is yet extant in print, to the General Assembly, 1690, containing an enumeration of the sins of the land, entreating in a most earnest Christian way a redress of these particular evils. Yet that assembly foresaid would by no manner of means allow that paper so much as a hearing. Sure, it is an ill tale, but it may be heard. Secondly, when Mr. Shields, L., and Boyd presented a paper of grievances in the assembly foresaid, truly momentous and worthy the deepest consideration, fervently begging a redress of the manifold evils relative both to the constitution of this church, the purgation of her members, and prevention of the further continuation and increase of such abominations, yet that paper could not be allowed so much as a hearing in open assembly. Yea, a reading or hearing was refused by public vote, much less could any redress be obtained. On the contrary, these men were reprimanded for owning the principles therein contained, and their paper branded with that odious stigma of, quote, containing several peremptory and gross mistakes, though they have made none of them appear to this day, unseasonable and impracticable proposals, uncharitable and injurious reflections, unquote. The sum of which paper is prefixed to the history of Mr. Rennick's life, printed in 1724. Thirdly, when Mr. John Hepburn and a considerable number of judicious Christians adhering to him presented a paper of grievances to the Assembly 1690 containing a pretty full enumeration of evils and crying sins relative both to the preceding and to that present time, Neither could it be allowed a hearing, no, not in the committee for overtures to which it was presented, much less in the open assembly, and no sort of redress of these grievances has been obtained. I may say, endeavored to this day, but instead hereof, Mr. Hepburn was censured, suspended, deposed, yea, imprisoned, and represented as erroneous, seditious, and given to divisive courses, as above. Which paper is to be found in the second part of a book, entitled, The Humble Pleadings, etc., where the world has a more full account of his sufferings under the harsh treatment of this church, printed 1713. Fourthly, when Mr. John Macmillan, minister of the gospel at Balmay, William Todd, minister of Butel, John Reed, minister at Carsfern, presented a paper of very weighty, just, and necessary grievances to the presbytery of Kirkcudbright, July 6th of 1703, to which several thousands in the land do adhere, even many that are in closed communion with this church, craving in a most humble and regular way that the presbytery foresaid would take some suitable and effectual way to have the church brought to assert explicitly the divine right of presbytery, the intrinsic power of the church, Christ's headship in and over his church, the sin of comprehending so many curates, etc., in the above-mentioned way, might be confessed that the like evils prevented for the future the public evils, scandals, and abominations, ministers and others were chargeable with in times of persecution, together with, a fully, uh, together with a full enumeration of the land's sins, might be publicly confessed and mourned over before the Lord, etc., and that the wicked laws standing in full force against our covenants might be rescinded, and our covenants revived and renewed, and partiality and discipline guarded against, etc., 